Everyone has heard of Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, and the James Younger Gang, but most know very little about the man whose story intersects with them all. Johnny Ringo was a charismatic B-list desperado with an A-list reputation in American West history. Romanticized in both life and death, John Ringo was supposedly a Shakespeare-quoting gentleman whose wit was as quick as his gun. His name still reverberates in town today. Yet, what adds to the enigma of Johnny Ringo is the enduring mystery surrounding his untimely demise, a death as legendary as his mythical life. So who was this infamous figure in the old Wild West? Stay tuned to uncover the intriguing tale of Johnny Ringo, early years. Born on May 3, 1850, and given the name John Peters Ringo, he was the first child of his parents, Martin and Mary Ringo. His birthplace, now known as Greens Fork, Indiana, was originally named Washington. It's worth noting that the Washington of Ringo's time differs from the town in Indiana bearing the same name today. John Ringo's middle name, Peters, was derived from his mother's maiden name, emphasizing the significance of his maternal lineage in his identity. On his father's side, his ancestry is traced back to the Netherlands, adding an international touch to his family history. Four years following Johnny's birth, his parents welcomed another addition to the family, his younger brother, Martin. It was around this time when John was six years old that the Ringo family embarked on a journey moving to Gallatin, Missouri. Johnny began his early education in Gallatin, taking his first steps into the world of learning. The family continued to grow with the arrival of a sister named Fanny Fern in 1857, further cementing the family bonds. As the 1860s unfolded, another sister, Mary Enna, joined the Ringo clan in 1860, contributing to the bustling household. The Ringo family's expansion didn't stop there, as in 1862, they welcomed their final child, a girl named Maddie Bell. Johnny Ringo's upbringing in this close-knit family environment undoubtedly played a significant role in shaping the man he would become in the tumultuous days of the Wild West. Influencing Ringo's Future? Johnny Ringo's family had intriguing connections in the backdrop of the Old West, including a noteworthy in-law relationship. He was the in-law cousin to Coleman Younger, known for his association with the notorious James Gang through his aunt Augusta Peters. While we can only speculate about the extent of influence this relationship may have had on Johnny, it adds an interesting layer to his family ties within the world of frontier outlaws. The Ringo family's journey westward in 1864 was driven by the turbulence of the post-Civil War era. As they made their way toward San Jose, California, they traversed the challenging terrain of Wyoming. Unfortunately, tragedy struck near the Platte River during their arduous journey. John's father, Martin Ringo, faced a horrifying accident as he descended from their wagon, resulting in his gun accidentally discharging. The buckshot struck him in the eye and penetrated his brain, tragically claiming his life. In a somber turn of events, the family was compelled to lay him to rest alongside the trail they were traveling. To this day, a marker serves as a reminder of Martin Ringo's final resting place, situated approximately 2.7 miles west of State Hui 95, along US 20, near the present-day Glen Rock, Wyoming. This traumatic incident had a profound impact on young Johnny Ringo, who bore witness to his father's untimely and gruesome demise. The combination of his father's austere demeanor and the violent accidental end could indeed have left a lasting imprint on Johnny's life. The enigmatic circumstances surrounding his own death would later add to the mystique of Johnny Ringo, making one wonder if his father's tragic fate played a role in shaping the man he would become and influencing the events of his life in the Wild West. Quotes related to Johnny Ringo. If you take the Tombstone movie at face value, it's clear that Johnny Ringo's legacy extends far beyond the realm of historical accounts. The film features some of the most celebrated quotes in Wild West lore, many of which are attributed to Johnny Ringo. 
In one iconic scene, Doc Holliday delivers a memorable line after a fateful duel with Ringo. You're no Daisy! You're no Daisy at all! Poor soul, you were just too high strung! This sharp-witted and taunting remark from Doc Holliday captures the tension and bravado that defined the Wild West era. It adds an element of myth and legend to Johnny Ringo's character in the movie. Another notable quote from the film occurs when Doc Holliday addresses Johnny Ringo. Why, Johnny Ringo, you look like somebody just walked over your grave. This line showcases Doc Holliday's poker-faced humor and his ability to unnerve his adversaries with his words as effectively as he did with his pistol. These movie quotes have contributed significantly to the enduring fascination with Johnny Ringo and the Wild West, illustrating how his character continues to captivate audiences and leave an indelible mark on popular culture. Was Ringo educated much? John Ringo's level of education has been a subject of debate and intrigue among historians and those fascinated by the Old West. Some suggest that he may have had an above-average education, even speculating about the possibility of a college degree. However, concrete evidence regarding his educational background remains elusive. An account from his tombstone friend, Billy Breckenridge, adds to the mystery. Breckenridge described Ringo as a mysterious man with a potential college education. He noted Ringo's reserved and morose demeanor and his tendency to turn to heavy drinking, perhaps as a way to cope with personal troubles. According to Breckenridge, Ringo was a gentleman when sober, but could become quarrelsome when under the influence. Despite such anecdotes, it is challenging to confirm the extent of Ringo's formal education, and there are no documented records of college attendance or significant educational achievements. In the movie Tombstone, there is a memorable scene where Ringo engages in a heated exchange with Doc Holliday, and they conduct their conversation entirely in Latin. While this makes for compelling cinematic drama, there is little historical evidence to support such an event occurring in real life. It serves as an example of how Hollywood can embellish historical events for entertainment value. After the Ringo family arrived in San Jose, they found themselves in the care of John's mother's sister and her husband, Thomas Coleman, Cole Younger. Notably, Cole Younger was the uncle of the more famous and youthful namesake, who gained notoriety for his involvement in robberies and murders. During this period, John Ringo assisted with the day-to-day -day work on the ranch, further solidifying his connection to the intriguing characters and events of the Old West, Texas Times. Around the age of 23, John Ringo embarked on a journey to Texas, where he had plans to explore a career in ranching. It was in Llano County that he crossed paths with a rancher named Moses Baird and struck up a friendship. However, the region was in the midst of a brewing conflict known as the Mason County War, or the Hoodoo War, which escalated in 1873. This conflict revolved around intense disputes between German immigrants and local ranchers, creating a volatile atmosphere. Johnny Ringo found himself drawn into this turbulent conflict and was eventually arrested in late 1875 on charges of murder. It was during this period that he developed a close friendship with ex-Texas Ranger Scott Cooley, who had taken the law into his own hands following the assassination of his adoptive father. Cooley believed that the German community was promoting unaccountability for this murder, and Ringo became involved in his cause. Ranchers in the area were outraged by Ringo's arrest and began planning to break him out of jail. However, they soon discovered that the authorities had transferred him to Austin, complicating their efforts. It was during his time in prison in Austin that Johnny Ringo encountered another legendary outlaw, John Wesley Harden, marking another influential era in his life. During this tumultuous period, Ringo's exploits came to the attention of his family, who, reportedly disapproving of his actions, disowned him. After spending two years behind bars, the charges against him were eventually dismissed. Upon his release, he took an unexpected turn in his career and was elected as the Llano County Loyal Valley Constable. However, 
This position proved to be short-lived, as he moved on from it after just a year. Ringo moves on to Arizona. It appears that around this time, Johnny Ringo's life took a downward turn, and he began heavily drinking, possibly as a response to the disapproval of his actions by his sisters. In late 1879, we find Johnny Ringo in Arizona, where he stirred up trouble in Safford. After being temporarily detained and released upon posting bond, he was scheduled to appear before the grand jury in March 1880. However, instead of showing up as required, he wrote a letter to Sheriff Charles Shibbel, explaining his absence. In the letter he stated, I write to let you know why I cannot appear. I got shot through the foot and it is impossible for me to travel for a while. He also requested that the sheriff advise the district attorney send any necessary paperwork and continue his bond. It seems that Ringo had concerns about his future plans in the area and wanted to remain in southern Arizona. Unfortunately for Ringo, the district attorney was not sympathetic to his situation and the court decided to revoke his bond. Subsequently, Johnny Ringo turned up in New Mexico where he became involved in mining property sales. By July 1880, he had returned to Arizona and was working alongside the Clantons. He joined Ike Clanton and a few other cowboys on a cattle drive and settled in San Simon, located in southeast Arizona. It was during this time that he frequented Galleville and associated with Not a Bull. Figures such as Curly Bill Brosius, further entrenching himself in the complex web of relationships and activities that define it the Wild West during that era, Ringo, the election official. By October 1880, it appears that Johnny Ringo's legal issues in Arizona may have been resolved or at least put on hold as he took on a role as a judge for the San Simon precinct election. Interestingly, his friend Ike Clanton served as an inspector for the same election. The election results in the San Simon Sienega precinct, however, raised suspicion. They showed only one vote for the Republican candidate, Bob Paul, for Pima County Sheriff, while the Democratic candidate, Charles Chabel, received a staggering 103 votes. These results appeared highly irregular and were eventually deemed invalid upon closer examination. This discovery prompted an election reversal, ultimately declaring Bob Paul as the rightful winner, raising questions about the credibility of the initial tally. In the early part of 1881, Johnny Ringo traveled to Texas, where he found himself involved in an incident. He falsely accused three individuals of stealing money from him, which led to his arrest by the infamous gunslinging Marshal of Austin, Ben Thompson. Ringo's lack of cooperation in the matter resulted in a fine. Subsequently, he made his way to Missouri for a brief period. However, by early July 1881, he had returned to Arizona, specifically to Tombstone. In early October of that year, Ringo made a visit to Galeyville, where he tried his hand at poker. Unfortunately, luck wasn't on his side, and he found himself losing money and growing increasingly frustrated. Frustration eventually drove Ringo to quit the game when other players refused to loan him money to continue. However, after some contemplation, Ringo had a change of heart and returned to the poker table. This time, he took a more aggressive approach, pointing his gun at the other players and leaving with the cash that had been on the table. This daring move didn't go unnoticed, and Deputy Sheriff Billy Breckenridge intervened, arresting Ringo on charges related to the incident. Surprisingly, no witnesses came forward, leading to the postponement of the court case and adding another layer of mystery to Johnny Ringo's tumultuous life in the Old West. Family and Cowboys In October 1881, Johnny Ringo made another move, this time heading to California to visit his sisters. Perhaps he was attempting to mend the strained relationships within his family, but it proved to be a challenging endeavor due to their strong religious beliefs. Despite his efforts, it seemed that his visit did little to win back their favor. While in San Jose, California, Johnny Ringo found himself far from the events transpiring in Tombstone, particularly the infamous gunfight at the OK Corral. However, on January 21, 1882, he returned to Tombstone. 
it is almost certain that he had heard from the cowboy faction, including Ike Clanton, about the events that had unfolded during the October shootout. From their perspective, the blame for the showdown rested squarely on the shoulders of the Earps and Doc Holliday. A significant incident occurred on December 28, 1881, when Virgil Earp was severely wounded. He was shot on Allen Street in Tombstone, and his brother, Wyatt Earp, known for his fearlessness, accused Johnny Ringo of being one of the assailants. However, no concrete evidence was produced to support this claim. In the aftermath of these events, Wyatt Earp made a decision that would further change the course of their interactions. He struck a deal with U.S. Marshal Crawley P. Dake to step into Virgil's shoes as Deputy U.S. Marshal, setting the stage for continued tensions and conflicts in the Wild West. Doc's no friend of Ringo. In mid-January 1882, Johnny Ringo found himself outside the Grand Hotel, where he spotted Wyatt Earp across the street, about to enter Hatch's Saloon. Taking a bold step, Ringo approached Wyatt with the intent of reconciling their feud. He proposed a shootout with Doc Holliday, suggesting that the loser should leave town, believing this would put an end to their ongoing conflict. However, Wyatt refused to entertain the offer, choosing not to engage in Ringo's proposition. The January 22nd edition of the Nugget newspaper reported an encounter involving Ringo and Doc Holliday on Allen Street, right in front of the Occidental Saloon. The article highlighted the existing animosity between the two men, stating that words were exchanged and both parties stepped back, placing their hands on their weapons with the intention of drawing and using them. Fortunately, Chief of Police Flynn happened to be nearby and promptly intervened, placing both Ringo and Holliday under arrest. They were subsequently taken to Judge Wallace's court, where they each faced a fine of $32 for carrying deadly weapons during the altercation. It's worth noting that this incident is often associated with the famous line attributed to Doc Holliday, I'm your huckleberry, although it's challenging to definitively confirm this detail from our historical vantage point. During his court appearance, Judge William H. Stilwell became aware of outstanding charges against John Ringo, likely stemming from his involvement in a poker table robbery in Galeyville. Consequently, Ringo was arrested and spent the weekend in jail. However, his lawyer managed to post his bond, securing his release. Sheriff John Behan, known for his favorable disposition towards the cowboy faction, allowed Ringo to go free even before the court officially approved his release. While in jail, Ringo became aware of Wyatt Earp's plan to arrest the Clantons and their associates, who were located in Charleston. Ringo wasted no time and headed straight to Charleston, an action observed by James Earp, who mistakenly believed that Ringo was attempting to flee. On January 23, 1882, James swore an affidavit, expressing concerns about Ringo's intentions. He stated that, The purpose and intent of said Ringo is to intercept one Wyatt S. Earp, a marshal entrusted Siki with the execution of warrants, and believes that the purpose of said Ringo is to obstruct the execution of said warrants, further adding to the mounting tension and drama in Tombstone's turbulent history. Ringo the accused, but no witnesses. On January 28, 1882, John Ringo made his return to Tombstone to address the charges stemming from the Galeyville incident. Bond arrangements were made, and he was granted temporary freedom. When the court date arrived in February, once again, no witnesses came forward to secure a conviction against Ringo, leaving his legal predicament unresolved. However, the situation in Tombstone took a grim turn on March 18th, when Wyatt Earp's younger brother Morgan Earp was tragically murdered. Johnny Ringo was among those accused in the aftermath of this shocking event. During court testimony, Pete Spence's wife shifted the blame away from Ringo, pointing instead to her husband Frank Stilwell, Indian Charlie Cruz, and an individual named Freeze as the perpetrators. 
Given Wyatt Earp's position as a U.S. Deputy Marshal, he obtained warrants for the arrest of those responsible for shooting Virgil and the murder of Morgan. Armed with these warrants, Wyatt formed what became known as the Vendetta Posse, a group with the goal of bringing those responsible to justice. During this critical period, the Earp brothers and Doc Holliday were in Tucson, making arrangements for Morgan's burial in California. It was in Tucson that Wyatt Earp confronted Frank Stilwell, who attempted to harm them. In a fateful encounter on the night of March 20th, 1882, Wyatt shot and killed Stilwell, marking a significant development in the ongoing conflict between the Earps. Posse after Posse. In the aftermath of Frank Stilwell's murder, Pima County Sheriff Bob Paul issued warrants for the arrest of Wyatt Earp and his posse members. Paul telegraphed John Behan, another lawman, instructing him to take them into custody. However, Wyatt largely ignored Paul's orders, setting the stage for further conflict. Undeterred, Bean remained committed to pursuing Wyatt and his posse and eventually assembled his own group to go after them. Meanwhile, Wyatt continued his relentless search for additional cowboys involved in the attacks on his brothers. Johnny Ringo was among those who joined Bean's posse in this endeavor. Tombstone diarist George Parsons expressed skepticism about Bean's chances of capturing Wyatt, noting that they will never do it. He observed that the cowboy element was strongly supporting Wyatt, with John Ringo as part of the group, and ominously mentioned the prospect of challenging times ahead. In April, there were newspaper reports indicating that Ringo was in the Tombstone area at the time. Ringo's trial for the Galeyville robbery had been rescheduled for May 1882. Once again, when the trial date arrived, no witnesses came forward to present evidence against him. As a result, the judge ultimately dismissed the charges, leaving Ringo free to go without any pending legal matters. Johnny Ringo's last known appearance in Tombstone was on July 12, 1882. Shortly after that, he departed the area, traveling through the South Pass of the Dragoons. He made a stop at Dial's Ranch for a meal before continuing on to Galeyville. During this period, those who encountered him noted that he was consuming alcohol heavily and expressing morbid thoughts about his impending demise. Ringo seemed convinced that his life was in imminent danger, likely at the hands of someone else. Following his time in Galeyville, it is believed that he ventured into the Morse Canyon area. Johnny Ringo discovered. On a Thursday afternoon, July 13th, two women were walking along Turkey Creek Ard. Their names were Mrs. Young and Mrs. Smith, and they later reported that they came across a man at the base of a tree. Initially, he appeared to be asleep, so they passed by without disturbing him. However, that same afternoon, residents of the nearby Smith house heard the unmistakable sound of a single gunshot. The following afternoon, a man named John Yost traveled down the road and also noticed the man by the tree. Just like the two women before him, Yost thought the man was sleeping and continued moving his horse team along the road. However, his dog had a different reaction and ran over to the man, sniffing and making unusual yelps. Concerned, Yost dismounted to investigate the situation and discovered that the man was, in fact, dead. To Yost's surprise, he recognized the deceased individual. It was none other than Johnny Ringo. He promptly reported the discovery, and within a short time, 12 other local residents arrived at the scene to provide information to the sheriff and coroner. The law enforcement officials assessed the condition of Ringo's body and examined the evidence at the scene. They estimated that he had been deceased for approximately 24 hours at the time of discovery. Ringo's body was found in a sitting posture, facing west, with his head inclined to the right. A bullet hole was observed at the top of his head on the left side. Strikingly, a part of his scalp appeared to be cut out, leaving a small area that resembled a scalped section. A detailed description of Ringo's clothing was provided, and an unusual aspect was noted regarding his feet. He was wearing socks, and around his feet were undershirt strips, wrapped around as if for protection, suggesting that he may have walked a short distance in this manner. 
Ringo's rifle was found resting nearby on the tree, while his gun was gripped in his right hand. Another peculiar detail was the fact that his cartridge belt was strapped on upside down. According to reports, his body was laid to rest near the location where it was discovered. Upon the immediate discovery of Ringo's body, discussions and conjecture among local witnesses and residents of the area began. Some believed that Johnny Ringo had encountered the unfortunate situation of finding his horse missing. He embarked on a quest to locate his horse, walking extensively, which eventually led to discomfort and soreness in his feet. Allegedly, he decided to remove his boots, and lacking proper footwear, he fashioned makeshift booties from his undershirt. It was surmised that a combination of these circumstances, along with ongoing difficulties in his life, had taken a toll on Ringo, possibly leading him to a state of depression. This, they believed, might have ultimately driven him to make the decision to end his own life. The coroner officially ruled Johnny Ringo's death as a suicide on July 13, 1882. Interestingly, his horse was later found wandering in the Turkey Creek area approximately two weeks after his demise. It's worth noting that Ringo's boots were hung saddle-side in accordance with a traditional practice when removing them. However, ever since the coroner's ruling, there has been persistent controversy and debate surrounding the circumstances of Johnny Ringo's death. Various alternative theories have been proposed over the years, though some are as plausible as the suicida scenario, contributing to the enduring mystery that surrounds his untimely demise. Alternate theories on Johnny Ringo's death. Ringo was killed by buckskin Frank Leslie. In the autumn following Johnny Ringo's death, a dispute erupted between cowboy Billy Claiborne and buckskin Frank Leslie. Claiborne had been expressing his anger to friends, alleging that Frank was responsible for Johnny Ringo's killing. It seemed that Claiborne might have possessed some inside information or knowledge about the situation. Eyewitnesses with descendants in Cochise County have reported sightings of both Leslie and Claiborne in the vicinity of Turkey Creek around July 13, 1882. In fact, a story that has been passed down through generations suggests that the two rode to Galeyville in search of Ringo. They encountered one of their ancestors and inquired if he had seen Johnny Ringo, only to later learn that Ringo was dead and had already been buried. All three individuals, Leslie, Claiborne, and Ringo, were associated with the Cochise County Cowboy Faction, and they had been friends at one point. However, the exact motivation behind their intent to locate Ringo and Leslie's subsequent actions leading to Ringo's death has never been definitively determined. Billy Claiborne did confront Buckskin Frank at the Oriental Saloon, where Leslie worked as a bartender. He initially entered the saloon to confront Frank and later returned with a rifle, challenging him to a duel. However, Buckskin Frank Leslie was known for his quick draw. And instead of Claiborne, it was Billy who fell victim to gunfire. Leslie testified that he shot Claiborne in the chest. The possible indication of a motive can be traced to what Billy Claiborne supposedly said on his deathbed, though it remains a subject of interpretation. Dr. G.C. Willis reported that Claiborne stated, He was a murdering son of a bee to shoot a man in the back. I was examining the back when he made that remark. I think he received the wound in front. It is unclear whether Claiborne was referring to Frank as the shooter of the man he sought to avenge or if he was confused on his deathbed, potentially implying that Frank shot him from behind. At a later point, Buckskin Frank Leslie was incarcerated in Yuma Territorial Prison. During his time there, he reportedly admitted to a guard that he had killed Johnny Ringo, asserting that it was an act of self-defense. However, this claim has never been definitively verified, and the evidence surrounding the case has grown too cold to make it a viable cold case. Nevertheless, among the various theories surrounding Johnny Ringo's death, this one may be the most plausible. Ringo was killed by Wyatt Earp. As Wyatt Earp advanced in years, he began to reflect on his adventurous Wild West life. His wife, Josephine, played a significant role in shaping the narrative, ensuring that it was told in a heroic and respectable manner. 
In the 1920s, both of them engaged with authors who could write Wyatt's biography, with an eye on potential book sales. One particular account that emerged during this period was Wyatt Earp's claim that he had killed Johnny Ringo. According to this story, the alleged encounter took place while Wyatt was leading his vendetta posse, and they were completing their tracking mission before departing Arizona. To add credibility to the tale, Wyatt even drew a diagram for these authors. However, a significant discrepancy arises when we examine the timeline. The Vendetta Posse actually crossed the border into New Mexico in March 1882, well before Johnny Ringo's body was discovered. Furthermore, they had left Arizona due to warrants issued against them, making it unlikely that they would have stayed or returned to the state, given the risk of arrest. After departing New Mexico, they moved on to Colorado, and Wyatt eventually settled in California. He did not return to Arizona for many years, only coming back when summoned to appear in court as a witness in a case related to a neighbor he had known during his time in Tombstone. Most seasoned authorities on Old Western history tend to discount Wyatt Earp's claim of killing Johnny Ringo. The timeline discrepancies and contradictions in Wyatt's accounts raise doubts about the veracity of his claim. In his later years, Wyatt embellished and enhanced his life's activities, a practice encouraged by his common-law wife, Josie. While a few historians may support his version of events, the majority remains skeptical. Ringo killed by Johnny Behind the Deuce. Johnny Ringo's real name was Michael O'Rourke, with the newspapers often omitting the O in his last name. He earned the nickname Johnny Behind the Deuce due to his involvement in gambling. On January 15, 1881, he found himself in a Charleston hotel bar, enjoying some food and beer when an altercation occurred. O'Rourke claimed he was insulted by P. Schneider, a well-known mining engineer in Charleston. As a result of this incident, O'Rourke was initially brought to Tombstone, specifically to Vogan's saloon, and subsequently transferred to the jail in Tucson. Newspaper accounts indicate that a mob followed him to Tombstone, driven by a desire for vigilante justice. However, the prisoner was shielded by Constable McKelvey, Marshal Sippy, and local Tombstone officers, including Virgil Earp. It's possible that Wyatt Earp, deputized by his brother Virgil, may have been involved in this protective detail, as suggested by Tombstone diarist George Parsons. However, Wyatt Earp's role in this particular event was not as prominent as some sources claim, and he was not the main hero. Some rumors have circulated that Johnny Ringo, or Ike Clanton, led the vigilante mob, but there is no concrete evidence to support these claims. The mob consisted of miners who were supportive of Mr. Schneider. Feeling that he had acted in self-defense and fearing for his life, O'Rourke decided not to take any chances with local law enforcement. He successfully escaped from jail on April 18th. The Tombstone Epitaph reported on May 13, 1881, that Johnny Behind the Deuce had been seen in the Dragoon Mountains three days prior. He was well-equipped and mounted on a horse, seemingly on the verge of departing for Texas. This marked his exit from Arizona, and he was never seen there again. Killed by Doc Holliday. Another version of Johnny Ringo's demise is intertwined with the legend of Wyatt Earp. Glenn Boyer, a retired U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel, novelist, editor, and self-proclaimed historian of Wyatt Earp, wrote a chronicle based on what Josephine Earp had reportedly told him about Johnny Ringo's killing. According to this version, Doc Holliday was alongside Wyatt Earp during the Vendetta Posse ride to track down Ringo. However, in this narrative, it was Doc Holliday who delivered the fatal shot instead of Wyatt. This version, like the one involving Wyatt, faces the same timeline challenge. Some suggest that a group, possibly including Wyatt and Holliday, returned to Arizona from Colorado in July. However, given the outstanding warrants for their arrest, it remains improbable that they would have taken such a risk. Most historians, for various reasons, reject this possibility. 
This particular version of events was depicted in the 1993 movie Tombstone, making for a captivating storyline. Nevertheless, based on the available credible evidence, it appears to be far-fetched, and many experts in the field share this assessment. The mystery surrounding Johnny Ringo's life and death continues to captivate history enthusiasts and Wild West aficionados to this day. With various theories and legends surrounding his demise, the truth remains elusive. What do you think happened to Johnny Ringo? Do you believe any of the theories presented here, or do you have your own take on the story? Share your thoughts and insights in the comments below. If you enjoyed learning about Wild West history, don't forget to like and subscribe for more intriguing tales from the past. Until next time, bye.